Welcome everybody to session 48 of the medical debate where we're going to be discussing palliative care. So first of all, what is palliative care? What do you think? Put your answers in the comments below and tell us what you know about palliative care already and any examples you know of where it's used in medicine today, i.e. which types of diseases are treated using palliative care most commonly and any statistics that you might know about palliative care. We're going to be covering these in later slides. OK, so hopefully you've had a chance to pause the video and put in the comments anything you know already about palliative care. We're now going to explain it in a little more detail. So let's talk about what palliative care exactly is. Palliative care is the specialised medical care for people living with a serious illness or a terminal illness. This type of care is focused on providing relief from the symptoms and stress of the illness and the goal is to improve the remaining quality of life for both the patient and the family because the illness is terminal and so serious. Palliative care uses a team approach to support patients and their caregivers and this includes providing counselling. It offers a support system to help patients live as actively as possible until death and it's required for a wide range of diseases such as cardiovascular diseases which is 38.5% 34% of cancer related diseases require palliative care, 10.3% of chronic respiratory diseases require palliative care, and 5.7% of cases of AIDS require palliative care. And as we can see, diabetes also requires palliative care, which you may not have expected, and this is at 4.6% statistic. These all come from the World Health Organization, and that's our source for these statistics. Palliative care is explicitly recognised under human right to health, and it should be provided through person-centred and integrated health, health services that pay special attention to the specific needs and preferences of individuals. So next, we're going to talk about the five stages of palliative care. During the first stage, an initial plan is created, and this should be flexible in order to provide the right care as a patient's illness evolves. Healthcare professionals and family members are often involved in making this plan. During the second stage, medical social workers, interdisciplinary teams and a chaplain may provide emotional and spiritual care for a patient and their family if the patient so chooses. In the third stage, nurses and physicians work together in order to create a care plan and ensure that the patient maintains as much independence as possible. It may be necessary at this stage to install home health aids and accept assistance from nursing carers with daily activities that patients are beginning to struggle with. During stage four, patient inpatient care is arranged at hospitals or hospices if wanted. And if patients don't want this but still require more help from medical professionals than previously, live-in care can be arranged so that patients always get the support they need without moving out of their comfort zone. This stage can also encompass end of life care. So this is where patients may be receiving drugs to make sure that they're happy um, and healthy and painless um, in the final stages before they pass away. And during the final stage, support for a patient's family and friends is provided um, in order to ensure that they are comfortable as, their, as the patient passes away. Next, we're going, to be talked about, we're going to talk about whether palliative care should be kept private. First of all, think about why someone might want to keep a terminal condition like cancer a secret. Put any thoughts you have in the chat below and we'll discuss your answers by replying to your comment if we can. Pause the video at this point to think about this question because it will help answer the um, ethical dilemma that we have below. So hopefully you've had a chance to pause the video and think about that question there. Why might someone want to keep a terminal condition secret? One of the main reasons is the stigma surrounding terminal conditions. There is still a stigma surrounding cancer patients, and that is a large um, reason why people aren't so open about it. Secondly, many family members or friends may become distressed when someone has a terminal condition, and therefore a, a patient may want to keep it a secret um, until near the end to avoid stress or worry um, for their family members. And this is the case in the case study we have below, which I'm now going to read out. Soraya, a 39 year old, has just been diagnosed with a cancer in her heart. The tumor is large and has already spread to several other organs. 
You suggest radiotherapy, although there is a very low chance of success. You also tell Soraya that palliative care might be the best option. It is unlikely that she will survive the next month. Soraya accepts this information, but she tells you that she wants to keep it a secret from her family and friends, as she doesn't want to worry or distress them. She says that her husband recently lost his brother and father in a car crash, and he would not be able to deal with losing his wife as well. She doesn't have any children. So, considering this information, do you think that terminal cancer patients should be obligated to tell someone about their condition? Why or why not? So pause the video at this point and have a think about that first question. So hopefully you've had a chance to pause the video and think about that question. Should they be obligated to tell someone about their condition? Hopefully one of your answers sent was centered around the idea of autonomy. Patients should be allowed to make any decision they choose. And in this case, um, a doctor should respect a patient's wishes. However, um, at the same time, a doctor may wish to tell the uh, patient's family members in order to um, ensure that they are um, aware of what's going on and they aren't suddenly shocked, which could, of course, affect non-maleficence or the well-being of these of the patient's family and friends. And the second question now, should a doctor ever share information about cancer patients with family and friends? And can you use deontology or consequentialism to argue this? So pause the video at this point and have a think about that second question. So hopefully you've had a chance to pause the video and think about the second question. Should a doctor ever share information about cancer patients? So firstly, you probably would have argued um, using deontology that lying is um, inherently wrong according to deontology. And therefore doctors shouldn't lie to family members and they should reveal all information. They shouldn't conceal anything. However, secondly, you might argue using consequentialism, this might not have the best impact on the patient as it's invading their privacy and their autonomy as well, and that ultimately affects their well-being. And therefore, you might argue that it's not in the patient's best interest to do this. So you could argue from either direction, but of course, in this country, a doctor wouldn't share confidential information as that breaches patient confidentiality, which is one of the central pillars of the NHS. So let's talk about an actual scenario. John, a 63 year old with no close family, has recently been diagnosed with a chronic lung condition. The condition has led to John near constant monitoring and John also needs to regularly take antibiotic pills. However, these cause him a lot of pain and are only 5% effective at treating the actual condition. During a hospital visit, you realize that John's lungs are in extremely poor health it is unlikely that he will survive another three months in this case. You speak to John and tell him that you believe moving to palliative care, in this case, taking John off the antibiotics and putting him on pain relief medication in his final months is in his best interests. However, John refuses and tells you that he doesn't want to die. He insists that he remains on the medication, even though you know it is both qualitatively and quantitatively futile. So just take a few minutes to read this again, pause the video if you need to read the scenario and really take it in. And what would you do in this situation? I will go over what you could do and how you could think about this problem using the four pillars of medical ethics, and then think about the question, who should decide whether a patient moves to palliative care? So let's talk about what would you do in this situation. Let's start off with the principle of autonomy. Autonomy is the principle that a patient should be able to have their own rights to decide their own care without being coerced by a family member or by a doctor. Therefore, it is very important to realize that in the autonomy pillar, we have to think that if he wants to be put not into the palliative care, but would rather continue with his course of action of treatment, and would rather continue with the antibiotic pills. And if that's what he wants, then we should continue with this because it is what the patient wants and that's what comes first. Let's talk about beneficence. Now, this is slightly difficult. For a doctor to think it is beneficent to be putting him on palliative care may mean that the autonomy conflicts. However, if in the medical interest of the patient, it is best 
to go into palliative care and the doctor believes that there is no way to actually treat the current chronic lung condition or to, to completely alleviate the symptoms for now, then maybe it is better to put him on the pain management medication and therefore put him on palliative care. And this can actually mean that the doctor should advise this. And this also ties in with non-maleficence. And then if we talk about the pillar of justice, because all patients must be treated equally, we must make sure that we are not giving John any special treatment. However, we are respecting his wishes just as any other patient. And we are making sure that he is heard just like any other patient. And we should be treating him to the best of our ability and his chronic lung condition to the best of our ability, making sure that we can do or we are doing all that we can whether this means to agree with his autonomy and continue with the antibiotics or whether this means to actually start him on the palliative care. We now talk about who should be given the responsibility or who should be able to decide whether he moves to palliative care or not, the patient, the doctor, etc. You have to first believe if the patient themselves can make this decision. If under the Mental Capacity Act of 2005 they're able to make their own decisions, then they should definitely be allowed to make this decision for themselves. If someone has been allowed legal power of attorney, then they should be allowed to make the decisions. And normally um, the family members are asked if the patient themselves cannot mention anything as to what their belief is. So we're now going to talk about medical decisions and palliative care. And we've got another case study here, which we're going to discuss. I'm going to read out the case study now. Gavin, aged 79, has recently been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. He has intermittent memory loss and often struggles to remember events and details from the past. Gavin has come into your hospital after struggling from a heart attack. Although still conscious, he remains in an unstable condition. Over the next few weeks, you move him to palliative care. Unfortunately, you do not believe he will survive for another 24 hours. In 1999, Gavin made the decision that he did not want to donate his organs. However, he now tells you that he would like to change his mind. Despite this, a recent mental examination concluded that Gavin's dementia made him incompetent under the Mental Capacity Act to make important medical decisions. Therefore, you are forced to tell him that you are not able to follow through with his wishes. So firstly, what would you do in this situation if you were a doctor and you didn't necessarily have to follow the NHS's guidelines or any rules? What would you do in this situation which you think would be ethical? Pause the video and let us know in the comments below what you would do in this situation. So hopefully you've had a chance to pause the video and type in the comments what you would do if you were, you were the doctor in this situation treating Gavin. Our second question is, should patients in palliative care be able to make important medical decisions which could impact their own or other people's well-being? Pause the video again and have a think about this question, and in particular, think about the four pillars of medical ethics. So hopefully you've had a chance to pause the video and think about the four pillars of medical ethics with regards to this question. So firstly, autonomy is the main pillar at play here. Patients should be allowed to make their own decisions um, because it's to do with informed consent. They are consenting to a certain um, treatment because they understand um, the pros and cons of that treatment and they should be entitled to a choice regarding their treatment. And that is one of the founding pillars of the NHS. However, making a decision without um, information, i.e. where um, a patient does not make an informed decision but they simply make a decision, um, that could lead to um, a negative impact on their own or other people's well-being. And this is why the Mental Capacity Act limits the autonomy of people who have conditions like dementia, regardless of the outcome that it could have. For example, in this case, if Gavin did donate his organs, then that could save another person's life. Um, however, the real-life scenario, in this scenario, if this were to happen in real life, um, then um, you you would be forced to tell him that you're not able to follow through with his wishes, regardless of what the outcomes could be, um, because the Mental Capacity Act judges whether people's you know conditions um, limit them from making an informed decision, and in this case, um, that would be the case. Now let's talk about whether ethical 
and feasibility comes into palliative care. Each year, an estimated 40 million people are in need of palliative care. Worldwide, only about 14% of people who need palliative care currently receive it. Palliative care is expensive and uses many resources in the NHS, and it will continue to put a large strain on the NHS in the future. Let's talk about, is it ethical to continue investing in it when any form of care provided will not prevent a patient's death? And is it moral to divert medical resources to palliative care when other patients whose lives could be saved could be treated? Let's start with the first question. It's very important to realise that in medicine, it's not just about treating a disease, but managing it. And this includes managing the symptoms and the pain. If we cannot manage the symptoms of a disease and we can manage the pain, then it is our duty to do so. And in this case, palliative care is also very useful. As we mentioned previously, counselling is a part of palliative care. And this may not only help with the actual patient, but could also help their families who may be struggling with the patient having a chronic disease or illness, which is very difficult to deal with. And secondly, is it more to divert medical resources to palliative care when other patients whose lives could be saved could be treated? It's very important to realise that there's no um guarantee that actually diverting resources could actually save someone else it could possibly be that diverting resources has no effect and therefore because of legality you should be and, and the justice pillar you should be treating every patient equally and as such you should not be diverting any resources without the patient's consent and you should be treating them to the best of your ability as you would any other patient Thank you very much for coming to this week's session of the Medical Debate, where we talked about palliative care and some ethical issues related to palliative care. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to email us at themedicaldebate at gmail.com, or alternatively, you can DM us on Instagram at themedicaldebate. We post these videos every single Saturday from 4pm to 5pm, and we make sure that anyone, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat below in the chat function, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Please also subscribe to our YouTube channel at The Medical Debate, where we will post our videos so you'll be the first to know when we've posted something new. Thank you very much for listening and hope to see you in the next session.